Good afternoon, everyone. This is our webinar on Python text encryption. And we're going to learn about encoding encryption and hashing by playing with Python text strings. Now, keep in mind, this is very introductory. We're really just dipping our toe in the water as opposed to taking a deep dive. I'm Sheila Crawford Bunch. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of Education for NC Lab. This webinar series is made possible by a Nevada State Library Archives and Public Records Continuing Education Grant funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services through the Library Services and Technology Act. NC Lab is a self-contained desktop platform where you can learn and use computer programming, modeling, and many other STEM skills. You learn through taking self-paced, self-graded courses. Apply the skills that you learn with the apps in Creative Suite, and we're going to be playing with one of those today. And build knowledge by studying ways to use the skills. So as I said, we're just dipping our toe in the water, but hopefully this will get you excited about all these ways of changing text and files to make them safer or there's a lot of reasons why you would encode, encrypt, or hash a file. So let's take a look. And feel free to pause this at any time, open your desktop, and try out some of these exercises. We'll go over purpose, we'll refer to the computer standards, we'll take a look at encryption whys and hows, and we'll break that down into encoding, encryption, and hashing. I'll show you where to find the parts of the Python course that fit what we're learning and also point you to some resources. In the hands-on part, we will write and print simple text strings, save strings to variables, parse and reverse text strings, and read, write, and share text files. And I have some ideas for a secret decoder club that might be a fun envelope for taking the Python 2 course. A little more formally with the Python 2 course, the Python app, and my files, we will understand how text encryption works and why we use it, write simple Python text strings, variables, and functions, use string methods and for loops to encode and decode text, share coded files and decode shared files, and generally become familiar with the Python 2 course modules in string operations coding, decoding, and file operations. And just a note at the bottom here, we are taking the content from Python 2 and creating some standalone course modules. You may see those in the near future. For example, you might see a short course in Python string operations, which is more or less equivalent to Unit 1 in the Python 2 course. You don't have to have any prior experience to play with the files and produce different results. The audience is most likely to be high school age or adult since this is really very plain vanilla text coding. It's not um, playing games like Carol, for example. Although, as we know, Carol is not easy and it's a great tool to learn computational thinking whether you're a child or an adult. I would try the offline games with younger children. They're quite fun and really get across some of the same skills. For participants who are taking the Python 2 course, this is a great way to try out their coding skills. The course teaches string operations in the first unit, and then in the second unit it goes into two main Python libraries, NumPy and Matplotlib, and works through list and tuple operations and works with functions and APIs. A lot of work on lists. If you're not familiar with what a library is in Python, it's basically a set of pre-made code. So instead of having to write out, you know, tens or hundreds of lines of code to do an operation, you go, hey, I need to do this operation. Oh, great, there's a Python library that does it for me. All I have to do is call the library and use some of their function names, and they'll do all this fabulous magic in the background. This is one of the joys of using Python is that uh, many, many people have contributed to these libraries and created a fantastic set of tools that are free. 
In Unit 4, this is where you learn a lot about file operations and dictionary operations and also how to translate information into some really beautiful data visualizations. Unit 5 doesn't affect what we're learning so much. It goes into object-oriented programming and some advanced operations and I, and I just mentioned it here for completeness. Educational standards. Well, we don't need these in libraries per se, but very often libraries collaborate with schools and certainly they provide much needed out of school time to practice coding. Local computer standards, and by that we mean state standards or district or even school site standards, are generally derived from two sets these days. One is developed by the Computer Science Teachers Association, CSTA, and the other is developed by the International Society for Technology and Education, or ISTE. In this exercise, we're introducing many basic coding skills. So that puts a focus on um, programming and our theme, so to speak, is encryption and that will lead to a broader discussion of cybersecurity. From CSTA, I picked these three standards and uh, they're all for the second and third bands. So that's grades 6 through 8 and 9 through 12 and the age equivalents. And, uh, you are going to be creating artifacts by using procedures within a program. The second set of standards really comes from network standards. In this case, you're applying multiple methods of encryption to model the secure transmission of information. We sometimes think of encryption as being something that spies do. Well, we have every transaction we make over the internet is encrypted, pretty much everyone. And that's a standard way of doing things. Uh, in the third standard here, we're comparing various security measures and considering trade-offs between usability and security of a computing system. If you make a system very complicated, on one hand it may make it more secure, but on the other hand it will slow it down and there's more opportunities for things to break. So there are always trade-offs when you're designing for security. These standards are not reviewed by CSTA for this lesson. They're just listed for reference only. And if you want to look at all the standards, I've put the link at the bottom of the page. From ISTE, really I think the standard, the behavior that is most helpful here is building out. So you have some basic skills, for instance, say using the replace method, a string method, but then that can really lead to some interesting explorations on ciphers that are built by substitution. But all of these activities uh, lead out to exploring real world issues. How is cybersecurity used? How are these methods used in the real world? Standards are, the link to the standards is at the bottom of the page and they're here for reference only. Okay, let's get into our subject. So why do we encrypt, encode, or a hash? There are four primary reasons why we do this. One is that we want to limit access. We have a right to privacy and privacy not just because we don't want everybody in our business, but we may be developing a business product that we want to keep confidential until we're ready to release it to market. There's all kinds of reasons why we limit access. We're going to prevent eavesdropping, protect sensitive information, and protect privacy. Those are the three main aspects of that. Also, it's a way to transfer data accurately and effectively. So if we're taking text and turning it into some kind of packet or signal that we're transmitting, we have to encode it and then we have to decode it at the other end. This goes for voice, images, text, any kind of data that gets changed and then changed back. Typically when you're transferring data, you're storing the data in packets or clusters or specific file structures to make the data flow better. So if you have a little piece that's broken, it doesn't stop the rest from going through and you can just resend that little piece that is broken. We want to protect data integrity. And this is both for data at rest, so it could just be sitting on a CD-ROM or in your hard drive or on a network server 
and you're not doing anything with it but we want to make sure that while it's just sitting there it doesn't get changed and then the other situation where we have to protect data is when it's in transit so it's transferring from one place to another and typically those measures check that the data remains intact and it doesn't become corrupted so authenticate we definitely want to know if we send a, a bank transfer to someone that the person receiving it is exactly who we sent it to um, or anything just permissions to get on a website you're constantly having your identity verified or your files verify it as being from a certain source just for fun there there's a couple of Wikipedia links at the bottom if you want to start your journey on exploring encryption and data integrity so how do we do this so we know the why's well how do we do it encoding so basically encoding your program is going to read the data and then it's going to rewrite it using a code and the same process happens in reverse it reads the encoded data and it decodes it encryption we're still encoding and decoding but we're going to add a key and some of these keys are very complex so uh, encoding a lot of times it's transparent the we want everybody needs to know what's going on in order for it to work but encryption you're going to make it a little more exclusive hashing short version of hashing is that you're taking data of any size and mapping it onto data of a fixed size and this could be something really small some people consider checksums to be a form of hashing uh, you'll see arguments about that both ways and uh, often it's just a single bit that's being toggled zero or one um, or it might be a, a very long file identifier as a hash it could be 512 bits long and again the, the longer hashes enhance security and prevent collisions so encoding we want everyone to know exactly how we're encoding and decoding it's not a secret and it should work the same every time and here are some examples for example braille is a fairly old type of encoding that allows people with limited or no vision to read by touch every letter is translated into a pattern based on six dots you can see those in elevators and there are braille books around that's a transparent form of encoding and decoding morse code well of course they were transmitting impulses over wires and this predates voice communication this is an old form of encoding and decoding morse code is still used but typically you use a computer program to change your text into dots and dashes and then it transmits over radio waves or telegraph which we don't have telegraph anymore but maybe telephone wire um, or fiber optic for that matter and then decoded at the other end ascii is a way for computers to use text so we start as um, for example english language characters and we also want to include upper and lower case uh, some of you may be old enough to remember the days when computer pr printouts were all caps um, it was they were pretty limited and um, I remember professors not being very happy about the students turning in their papers written on computer printout paper in all caps but that was a long time ago anyway it does translate characters upper and lower case punctuation marks accented characters uh, in fact now it's called it evolved to something called Unicode um, and that really accommodates all languages in the world and it translates these to numeric codes and then the numeric codes can be used by the computer they're broken down again from there but the computer is a number cruncher so um, we take all this and translate it into codes and then of course it gets translated back another example is a, a language dictionary for example an English Spanish dictionary and um, in in Python these are stored as key value pairs there is a structure called a dictionary it's not just used for language these can be changed so if you don't have a perfect translation you're not stuck with it you can change the translate translation and improve it but again it, it's something that we want 
to be usable by everyone. It's, these aren't secrets. It's fun to watch how machine learning is improving computer translation. This is something to keep an eye on. You'll see automatic translations getting better and better through machine learning. Okay, let's take a look at Morse code. And there's some rules that were used to develop Morse code and many encoding schemes. In the old days, you had to click a key, it was called a key, to make the signals. You don't have to make any more clicks than absolutely necessary. And same thing when you're hearing it at the other end. Uh, if it's a common letter, you want to keep it simple. So T is one dash, and Morse code is all long signals and short signals dashes and dots, and E is one dot. And there's the sentence I color-coded it to show you how that looks. The next four letters are A, I, M, and N are all combinations of two dot and dash, and dot, dot, dash, dash, and dash, dot. And the most famous Morse code signal, of course, is SOS, which is three dots, three dashes, and three dots. It's very distinctive. It's easy to hear also in Morse code, Morse code operators use shortcuts. So a weather report is written as WX and that makes it easy to transmit and easy to decode when you're hearing it. But you know what it means. You know that WX stands for weather report. So NC Lab, there's a section on practicing text replacements or encodings with Morse code. And um, if you want to go to the level 4.2, it's a demo. It'll show you how to replace letters with Morse code symbols. You can use this text method, text replace, to replace your letters with any code. You can make up your own and then print out the results. So if we look through this line by line, the first line shows text that we're going to encode, in this case Morse. We've decided we're just going to change that text to all lowercase. That simplifies our task. So we're not worried that this is a capital M. Um, we're, we only have to create a scheme for a lowercase m if we change everything to lowercase to begin with. And then we just go through it. We any Anytime it finds the letter M in the text, it's going to replace it with the Morse code. So in this case, two dashes. The symbol at the end will just divide up our, our characters so when we print it out we can read it and so forth. It's changing every occurrence of these letters with this symbol and at the end it'll print the results. This little program can be used to really make any kind of encoding scheme. There are several places in the course that teach conversions, encoding, decoding. The first one here is changing decimals to binary. And of course, computers are turning on and off signals. That's binary, zeros and ones. And then there's an exercise in section 12. There's the whole section 12 is devoted to ASCII code. So it shows you how to convert text to ASCII and back. And in 13, you're working with hexadecimal. This is another numeral system used very commonly in computing. So how do we encrypt? We have an idea of encoding. How do we encrypt? Well, we use one method is to use patterns and substitutions. And you can do something very simple, such as shifting or reversing the alphabet. We have an example of that in the course called ROT13 that was used I believe Second World War or maybe First World War. Then you can make it a little more complicated. You can use what are called scrambled or deranged ciphers. You've taken the arrangement apart, not that they're crazy. When you do that, you still you want to take the next step, which is to turn them into fixed length blocks to avoid word detection. If I see a single letter word all the time, chances are that symbol is the letter A. So I can start decoding my cipher by looking for common words, words like a uh, and the and in and so forth. And after a while, you can decode every letter or enough of the letters that you can decode the text. So the traditional fixed length block is five. And then you can pad your code with nonsense or nulls. This makes it a little more difficult still to decode. 
Another problem is not just word length, but letters towards the end of the alphabet are low frequency letters. And if you've ever played Scrabble, you know this. Um, Z, X, Q, those kind of letters are worth a lot more than A's and E's. This is another trick that people use called frequency analysis to break a cipher. There's two types of keys. One is a symmetric key where both parties have the same key to encrypt and decrypt. And it makes it difficult for outside parties to figure out, but if you get a hold of that key, then you've got the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. And it is an older method. In the last few decades, decades we've been using public and private keys. Everyone has access to the public key, but only the receiving party has a private key. Um, this is another area that's interesting to research. Pretty good privacy. It's still in use. Obviously, these things evolve. Okay, an encryption example in Carol. I mentioned we're going to be working with a Python 2 course, but this example is from Carol. It's from the fifth unit in Carol, one of the last exercises. It uses something called the card and grill. And literally, it was a template made out of leather with holes in it. So when someone sent you their secret message, you put your leather template over it and you read off those letters. And then you turned it around and you read off those letters and so forth. And that way you could decode a message. So the instructions in Carol mention that uh, six by six grill, uh, that's six rows by six columns could be used to encode a message up to 36 letters. And this is one of our, our offline activities that we do as a companion activity. And here's an encryption example in Python 2. This is in section 12, so it's related to the study of ASCII. It's the ROT13 code. This is a substitution type of cipher. A little bit about hashing. Well, hashing basically compares data to see if it's, they are the same, and a lot of things get hashed. We just want to make sure we're using the right data, and we want to avoid picking files with the same hash. So that helps us decide the type of hash we're going to use. You know, if you're just pulling files from a small group of items, you probably don't need a very long hash because um, there aren't that many to choose from. If you're pulling it from a large bucket of millions of items, then you do need much more uh, complex hashes to keep them apart. And uh, as we mentioned before, it's exactly the same number of characters regardless of the size of the original data. And it can be used to check data integrity. Um, it can also be used in very highly secure situations such as Bitcoin transactions or say the NSA. In fact, the National Security Agency, one of the jobs they do is create um, ways to hash. So uh, we don't teach hashing in the Python 2 course. It really is beyond the scope of the course, but you can play with it in the app. You can import a library called Hashlib and you will get this code. I'm going to send the, some sample codes on a spreadsheet to you so you can try some things out with it. Just, it's just fun to see how it works. You can do things like print the available algorithms. This is just a line of code. Print hashlib.algorithms underscore available. That's a command and it'll print all the stuff out. I just dressed it up a little bit. I gave it a title and some spacing just so that it prints out nicely. And then created two hashes. There's different ways to do it. In this case, we just created one using this particular hashing algorithm. And then we put in the text that we wanted to hash. I, I can't help it. I'm a big Monty Python fan. So I'm going to be using lots of Monty Python type jokes. And you'll find these in the Python documentation. So this one, actually, nobody inspects the Spanish repetition is an example from Python 3 and uh, so that was the text we put into H1 and then if you print out what's called the hex digest this creates the code and you can see this long string of alphanumeric characters 
and that represents this text file nobody inspects the Spanish repetition and then again you can make another one just call it a different name H2 using the same scheme and this time we're making a hash for poking with the soft function and there's its code and you can see it's completely different and both of these are exactly the same length and the documentation for this is is over here in the link to python.org and try and work with the third version well there's many forums on the internet where you can find sample code to try out in the python app and just try some search terms i found some really cool stuff just searching on hashing strings with python uh, and you'll soon find out there's all kinds of neat um, ways to make your data more secure. And a common method is salting passwords with random numbers. So if you search on that, you'll, you'll find some examples on how to do that. There are tables called rainbow tables that are used to hack codes. There's different ways of attacking codes. So you can look at brute force and dictionary attacks. And now you're starting to explore the world of cybersecurity. Okay, so let's write some code. Just to make sure you know where we're at on your desktop, the courses, you can learn your skills and practice them in the course. And you can look at some of the examples we mentioned earlier in this presentation. Then Creative Suite is where you're actually going to write your files and run them and save them. That's important to know where that is. And then you're going to store your files in your online storage folder. You can also store them offline. But typically, if you're sharing them, you're going to store them in your NC Lab folder there. So courses, just to find the courses. Of course, there's Carol. We did have that one example from Unit 5 and Carol. This is the, where the Python 2 course is in the course folder. And then within the Python 2 course, there are five units. And I haven't really mentioned Unit 5 much because it doesn't apply as much as these other ones. If you've never done any Python at all, start with text operations. and It'll help you write some basic strings and use text methods. And it goes from there. There's a lot about encryption in Unit 3. And definitely Unit 4, you'll need to learn file operations from Unit 4. In the apps, so for in Creative Suite, then you want to go to Programming, Open Programming, and within there you'll see Python, and that's the one you're going to use. This is what the Python app looks like. It always has some sample code. You feel free to run that. It's kind of fun and creates a dragon fractal. Just be familiar with the buttons on the bottom. Run will run the code. Step allows you to step through your code one line at a time to see how it's behaving. And when, if you're stepping, then at some point you can stop it as well. Before you start, you're not writing a dragon fractal, so go ahead and erase the existing code. And that'll give you a blank slate for writing your own. You're also going to do a lot of file saving and retrieving. So in the file menu in the Python app, make sure you save your file and rename it every time you uh, want to create something new. You can also save it locally to disk for local sharing. If you want, you can build a tutorial or game around your worksheet. Let's say you want to demonstrate a particularly cool code. You can create a game, and we've spent a lot of time looking into creating games with Carol. It's more or less the same method of game creation here as you do in Carol. Once you save the file, you can publish it to the web. You create a URL, and that can be shared with others so they can run your code, especially if you have encoded something and you want to see if they can break it. That's where you use the URLs. Text basics. Well, you write strings just like you would type. And a string, they refer to them as strings, that's text. It's actually a data type in Python. We have other data types like Boolean is a data type and integer is a data type and so forth. Well, a string is a data type as well. And when we type it, Python knows it's a string because we enclose it in either single or double quotes. And it doesn't have to make any sense and it could be a string of numbers, but as long as it's enclosed in these quotes, Python recognizes it as a string data type. 
We also have a command called print and it'll print anything that's in a set of parentheses. In this case it prints I am a text string. So let's see how that works. I'm going to go ahead and open Creative Suite. Programming, Python, I'm going to erase, yes, and I can just say, oh let's do the classic, hello world, and there we go, and I can just say print, actually I can put print in front of it, print, Hello world, there's my parentheses, and I run my program, and there it is, hello world. Well, if I want to do a lot of things with that text string, I don't just want to have to type it every time. So instead of printing the statement directly, actually what I want, not that, I'm going to go back. I am going to save it to a variable, so I'm going to just call it variable hw equals hello world. You notice that my end parenthesis changed to red is warning me that I'm missing my front parenthesis. So okay hello world and now I'm just going to say print hw. There it is again. So th this is a, a very simple trick and allows you to do all kinds of things with your your um, text string once it's saved to a variable and um, makes your life a lot easier. And that's what I just did. I assigned the string to the variable and printed it out this way and here's an example also from Mighty Python. Um, one of my favorite characters, John Cleese plays a stuffy English professor named Ann Elk who has a theory about the brontosaurus and uh, basically all she goes on and on about the fact that the theory belongs to her. So that's another example. Okay variable names. You can be, have any combination of upper and lowercase letters and digits and underscores but just don't start your variable name with a digit. That's going to throw Python off. You're going to think it's something else. Okay so you can perform operations on text strings and in some cases they're just like you would operate on numbers. So for example we can add and multiply text strings and here I've multiplied wake up Polly Parrot three times and asked it to print that out and sure enough it's printing out wake up Polly Parrot three times. And you'll notice in my text string I have included blank spaces and that's so when I print it out I have a nice space between each of my commands to the parrot to wake up. There are all kinds of functions that are used with strings. They're known as string methods. Strings are basically a class of objects and we won't say anything more about object-oriented programming than that but uh, that's what they are. So let's take a look at string methods, the Python documentation. This is always a problem when you go straight to documentation. Watch this is really long. It's a long long document. Just one section and it can be overwhelming and that's why you take courses from NC Lab first and then um, you feel like Superman and you can start parsing these sites. So uh, one little trick I always use with long documents and probably everybody knows this but it's worth reiterating is I use control F and that puts that little box up there and I can write in string methods and there's three occurrences. It goes to the first occurrence but isn't that nice? It took me right to string methods in the document. So here's now a list of all kinds of string methods. There's tons of things you can do to strings for various reasons. I just wanted you to see a list of string methods. So methods are a neat way to automatically change a string. Remember when we're encoding or encrypting we're, we're changing what we have into something else. So let's try just replacing a word in a string. Once you get a little handy with typing your code you can write your commands within print, print statements or commands within commands. So here we have our string. We assign this text string to this variable str now we're using the replace command so we print 
str.replace, and in this case we're going to replace the word eggs with the word spam. If we just write it like this, all the occurrences of the word eggs are going to be replaced with spam, and that's what's going to print out. I'll have spam, sausage, spam, and spam. If we only want to replace one occurrence, we can add a third argument. In this case, we're going to say, just replace the first one, please. And in this case, I'll have spam, sausage, eggs, and spam. Only the first occurrence of eggs here was replaced with spam, and it kept the second one. So again, try having some fun with statements and replacing words with other words or letters with other letters and you can tell how many of those you want to replace. This is a neat trick too. Once you've replaced, say, the first occurrence of eggs with spam, then it won't be there anymore. You can uh, start messing around with the second occurrence of eggs and replace it with something else. You have a lot of fun with replacement. All right, so uh, we want to be able to automate some processes and we certainly can do that to reverse a string. And in this case, we're using a for loop. And a for loop will go through the text string one letter at a time. In this case, we're changing the order. So the string variable is called orig. And this is the reverse string that it's equal to. Here we've created a new text string variable called new. And it is empty. You'll see there's nothing between the quotation marks. And then we're going to loop through this first text string. So for C, C is, stands for character in ORIG or original. We're going to add a letter to new. So new will be C, that character, plus whatever is already in new. The first time we run this, there's nothing in there. As we loop through, it'll add letters. And then at the end, we can print new and it'll reverse the whole thing. So let's try that out. Okay, so here's the string I showed you, and let's run through this with the step function. I, I can't make this any, oh yeah, I can make it bigger here. <clears throat> make it so you can see it a little more easily. All right, hopefully that's, eh, maybe one back. Okay, so I'm going to step through this, and you'll see what happens. This window will tell you exactly what's happening on each step. It's created a variable that's a string type. It's global in scope. We're not getting into global and local right now. And it's called orig for original. And there's the value. There's the whole text string. Okay, let's go to the next step. And there's my variable named new. It's also global in scope. It's a string. And you can see it has nothing in there. All right, now it's defining us our variable C, our letter. The first value is the question mark. But now we have it in new. So it's now part of new. Okay, we're going to go through new again. And th this time we're looking at our next letter in first string, which is R. And so it's going to pull out R. And now new has R question mark. So I'm going to go through that a little faster. Next one is O, and now that's added to new. Next one is L, now that's added to new. And so it's just going through the whole string letter by letter until there's nothing left. And the program already knows when it gets to that last quotation mark, that's the end. That's kind of nice because we don't have to tell it how long the string is. We just write the string and get it to work on it. And there it is. It printed out what is your favorite color. Okay, hopefully that made sense. Um, again, you're going to get this file so you can play with it and see how it behaves. So playing with all these functions and methods and for loops and lists by encoding, encrypting, or hashing, it's just a great way to practice your coding skills. And then you can save them and share them and try and figure out how you someone else altered a file. So speaking of which, now we have to know how to create a text file in NC Lab. 
you already know how to save your code. That's not a big deal. You go to the file menu, save, get it, give it a name, it saves your code. But what if we want to just save the text? So we're not giving away all our secrets on how we created it, we're just saving the text. And uh, just a little heads up, NC Lab uses a Unix or Linux file folder notation. So you'll need to use this little tilde and the forward slash in front of your file name to put it in the home folder. And one way to do this is to again create a file um, and we're going to open a text file and this again is an empty file. There's nothing in there. And we're going to call it Black Knight. So this is Black Knight and it's a text file so the extension is .txt and you'll see this whole thing is in single quotes. And these are various arguments you can append. So if you put X, it'll create a file, but it'll return an error if the file exists. And these are really handy little tricks. And then once we've opened this file, remember it's empty, it just has a name, we're going to write something to it. So we're going to do f.write and we're going to write our little uh, text in there. It's only a flesh wound. And then we close it. So now that file exists and let's see what happens. Alright, so if we go to our My Files, uh, we'll find a file called Black Knight. We know we created it. And we know it's a text file. It has the extension TXT. And if we open that, it'll open it in Notepad, which is a text file reader and writer. And there it is. It's only a flesh wound. Let's try that for real. There it is. That's the file I created. And I'm going to just click on that. And there it is. It's opened in Notepad because it's a text file. It's only a flesh wound. Okay, so let's say I want to figure out, or I want to run that through my encoder. So I could copy it. And where's the one about color? Color reverse. Okay, I'm going to rename this first because I don't want it to overwrite my sample file. So I'm going to do save as and I'm going to call it Black Knight Reverse. Okay, so you can see now it's called Black Knight Reverse. And I'm going to actually reverse it. So I'm going to take that text from the, my text file. So I'm now encoding it. It's only a flesh wound and i got to remember my quotation marks. Okay, all right, here we go. Oh, what did I forget? String was never closed. There's no, oh, I know why, because I used single quotes. That's one of those things about, you'll learn in, in string operations. If you have a single quote or an apostrophe in your text, it thinks you're closing the string there. So in my case, what I'm doing is I'm using double quotes to include it to enclose the whole string. So that'll accommodate my single quote. And there's a lot of different ways you can manage that, but that'll work. So da 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 da. Ah, there it is. It's nicely reversed. So I could now do the same thing if I wanted to write a file with the encrypted version of it. I could. I could um, use the same text that I used here and put those words instead. So a little a little awkward. There's much smoother ways to do it, but since we're beginners, we're going to keep it pretty basic. All right, let's go back. All right, so if you want to learn more about reading, parsing files, displaying lines, manipulating files in different ways, do go to Unit 4 in the course. That's where you'll learn all those tricks. And if nothing else, read 16.1. In this case, we're using a different command to open it. It's called with open uh, as f instead of starting our line with f. That allows us to do all kinds of things. In this case, we're using a for loop to parse it line by line. So it'll print every line out as a separate line. All right, sharing files. We did this in Carol before and in 3D modeling. 
same thing. If we want to publish our code, we go to the file menu and there's an option publish to the web and it'll pull up this little window and you're going to select how you want it to share. You can say, nope, it's not going to be published or people can just view it or people can view it and run it or people can also edit the same file. And this link can be shared in social media, but typically what you're going to do is copy the link to a clipboard and share the actual link. And when I share files with you in the spreadsheet, that's exactly what I do. All right, let's say we're going to do a workshop around this. I'm suggesting four sessions here, but you can loop this. In the first session, you want to practice writing strings and saving files. Those are basic operations. It's really difficult to write anything unless you do those. And then maybe play some of the offline decoding games. They're simple and fun. Then in the next session, try creating some decodable files and sharing them. And you can build it off the sample files or if you're feeling like you want to really try your skills, you could use some skills that you learn on in the course. Then I would point people toward to starting on the Python 2 course. So they, they learn some more coding skills. And then I would say um, the next session, you're really primed to do some research. You can look up all these areas of encryption online, encoding, encryption, and hashing. Also, you might find some really fun sample code that you can import uh, into your Creative Suite app and try out and save as a file. So this series of practicing, doing some encoding, decoding, working on the course and research, I think it's a nice loop that you can repeat as you wish. So some decoding games. Well, uh, yeah, we've done these ever since we were little kids. And two that come to mind are Hangman, paper and pencil game and mastermind where you're trying to figure out what pattern the other person has created and they give you clues by telling you whether that color is in the pattern and if it's in there more than once so that's a great game and very fast to play it doesn't take long to play same thing with hangman all of these games have been encoded into online games so this could be a research possibility. You can research flowcharts that show the logic. Just look up mastermind flowcharts. You'll be surprised what you see. And also how people have started writing algorithms and code to um, turn these into online versions. Okay, the other example is the one that's in Carol. It's the card and grill. And you just need squared paper. And I'd suggest something with large squares like square centimeters or even square inches and some pencils and a piece of cardboard or cardstock something that's not too hard to cut out but it's opaque uh, for an overlay and you'll need some sharp pointed scissors to cut out the squares so if you want you can always point them to Carol level 25.4 I just copied the description from that level you can do it as teams of two or you can just do it as partners you create a grill and a code and then swap them and decode the text. And you could try with the same grill again and different codes. So this just practice the, the method. I would keep it simple for, for younger children. Just use a six by six. And you can always pre-cut the grills if you have very young children. Okay, another game could be a, sort of a version of telephone. You have four people seated at a table. Initially, when you play this game, you might want to have just one person start the game and pass it around. And then eventually, everyone can take those roles at the same time. So everybody can be a number one, and then a number two, and then a number three, and then number four. So, um, but start out simple. So here's an example. Person one writes a simple nonsense sentence. And the reason why we're doing nonsense sentence is because a, a normal sentence you might be able to figure it out from context. Uh, roses are red, violets are blue. It's a very common little rhyme and if you got a couple of clues out of that you could probably figure it out because you know the rhyme not because you really decoded the letters. To some extent that's going to go on anyway. If we get some clues that that word is purple we're going to figure out pretty quickly that it's purple. 
So here's a nonsense sentence. Purple socks sing cloth chips. So you have that on one piece of paper and then on a separate piece of paper write an encrypted version. And we're going to do some simple substitution. So all we're doing here is substituting two letters. Anything that is an S will become a W and anything that's a C will be an A. So now it, it already looks a little strange. Purple, I can't read that. But it's, it's starting to not look like itself. All right, round two. So person two is going to decrypt the message. If they're good, you both get a point. And then person two is going to take that encryption scheme and add another factor. For example, you could reverse it. What you might do is agree on encoding schemes as a group to begin with. Say, okay, we're going to do, we're going to substitute two letters as first round. We're, we're going to reverse it as the second round. And uh, that way people know the basic tools. They might not know which letters have been changed, but they should be able to figure it out. So once they figured it out, then they're going to pass the schemes in the latest encoded sentence to person three. Person three is going to take the double encrypted scheme and place the code in same size blocks. Remember that was one of the tricks that they had to do so people didn't guess what the word was by the length of the word. So all they're doing is now they've taken that text that has the two substitutions and it's been reversed and they're chunking it into five letter blocks. And then person four is their lucky job to figure out what the original text was. So again, try it just one message at a time in rounds to get used to the game and then you can have everybody working at the same time and passing them along. If you have groups working at different tables, you could take that last message without any of the schemes and exchange it with another group and see if they can crack the code. So uh, keep it simple to begin with. Um, like I said, as a group, you might decide in advance what methods you're going to use. And then later on, maybe you don't tell the person they have to guess what method you're using. All right, so there's some ideas for some offline games, three of them, four of them, I guess. It's uh, Hangman, Mastermind, the Card and Grill, and then just the, the Round Robin encrypting game. To go back over our webinar, we talked about why we're doing it and some of the standards we're addressing. Encryption wise and hows, and I'm using encryption in a very broad sense because as we saw, it breaks down into encoding, encrypting, and hashing. I showed you where to find these things in the Python course, pointed you to, you to a couple of resources online, but really these days uh, you put your search term in your search engine and you're going to come up with all kinds of fabulous stuff. We learned how to write and print simple text strings and save them to variables and why we do this. We parsed text strings with for loops and um, used the for loops to reverse the text strings. We also used a text method called replace and you can use that to do substitutions. And we learned how to read, write, and share text files. And some ideas on how you could start a, for lack of a better term, a secret decoder club. All this material is going to be posted on the community page uh, the, under just use the keyword webinar and you'll find it as one of the library webinars we've done. And uh, you'll get the recorded webinar, the slideshow, and also a spreadsheet with the URLs of files that we've used in this presentation. And you can try them out and play with them yourself. You can reach NC Lab anytime through support or from the main number. And um, just to, for teachers and librarians, there are materials also at instructor resources. And of course, feel free to contact me as well. Our next webinar is going to be on a visual introduction to Python. We're going to explore unit one in depth. So this is the same format we use for the deep dive for Carol, but we'll only focus on unit one. And that'll really help you get um, your patrons started with that course. Um, it's a fun course. You're writing code and drawing things. And, and as you know, you can extrude them and print them as well. So until next time, happy encoding and happy decoding.